So thank you everybody for showing, showing up today for another session of MIT's computational thinking class. I, my name is Erez Kaminsky. I'm hosting this entire course series along with Dr. Craig Carter and uh, Mr. Kelvin Misko from Wolfram Research. Uh, and I will introduce today's speaker talking about computational finance and economics, or computational economics and finance. I got it backwards. So Dr. Philip My Maimon, and he can correct Maimon. My apologies, is a professor of analytics and the director of the Master's Sci of Science in Business Analytics program at the Fairfield University. He is the founding managing director of Algorithmic Finance and the co-founder of the Journal of Sports Analytics. He is also an insight partner with Ascentia Analytics. He holds a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago, a master's in applied mathematics from Harvard University, and a bachelor's in computer science from Harvard University. He also holds a JD uh, and is an attorney at law admitted to practice in California. So uh, a lot of knowledge here that applies to everything, right? From finance to a lot of economics uh, and a lot of math like we like. Uh, Dr. Maimon has been a portfolio manager uh, at famed hedge fund, I guess, long-term capital management, uh, very well known today, Ellington Management Group and his own hedge fund, Maimon Capital Management. Uh, beyond all that, and most importantly, He's the only person to have won both the grand prize for the best research paper and the hackathon at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. Um, in today's talk, Dr. Maimon will discuss a computational approach to building economic and financial models from the ground up instead of through top level data. He will discuss how such models are able to generate the same facts as top down models, but in a more robust way. And I think I've said enough, uh, Dr. Maimon, please. Thank you, Aris. Uh, welcome, everybody. Let's get started. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, everything looks fine. You can hear me, you see me. Um, please ask questions anytime. Uh, I may not be able to see you, if, or you know, if, certainly if your video is off, I can't telepathically tell that you want to speak. So just unmute yourself and keep talking until I hear you. And that'll be great. OK, I, I won't be offended. In fact, I'll be offended if you don't. Please ask, ask questions anytime. Interrupt me. Something's unclear, whatever. Okay, here's the plan. Uh, we're gonna look at voting cellular automata. Uh, we'll, get, we'll do a little history lesson, uh, look at minimal models of financial complexity, economic complexity, and a new, uh, new model on freedom and lockdowns. Um, a lot of this work is joint work with uh, my dad, Zach Meinman, who if you scroll all the way to the bottom of your participants list, I think he's, he's here. Uh, the main takeaway, if you remember nothing else, I hope you remember something else, but if you remember nothing else, uh, the main approach I'm gonna talk about how to do things, uh, it'll apply to economics and finance, but it's really a more general rule of thumb. Uh, when, when Zach, my dad and I, when we work on projects uh, very often, we do them po Wolframsky. That's Russian for in the Wolfram way. Uh, what's the Wolfram way? Uh, that means based on a you know, new kind of science kind of thinking, instead of going top down, right? And looking for the little bits of predictability that exist, instead start bottom up and look for the simplest possible model and then explore from there. Uh, in other words, don't tweak parameters, see all possibilities and see what comes out, right? That's for Wolframsky. Okay, now you've got a Russian lesson too. Here we go. So let's start with the review. You may be familiar with element, elementary cellular automaton. If you're not, um, well, now you are. What's a cellular automaton? Yeah, every, every person is a cell, either black or white, and it's just one dimensional, it's just a row, it's a circle, right? We all live in a circle. Uh, and I have a neighbor to my left and to my right, and everyone else has a neighbor left or right. And we can be either white or black. And so let's, here's a first pop quiz for you. Uh, Every cellular automaton, every one dimensional cellular automaton like this, I'm the middle cell. My, the value that I become tomorrow, whether I'm white or black, depends on what I am, whether I'm currently black or white, and what my neighbors are. And it matters what order the neighbors are in. So having uh, my left neighbor be black, but I'm white, my right neighbor is white, is different from uh, this, ex from here, right? Where it's my right neighbor. These are different. So there are how many different possible states for me to be in, right? Well, how many different inputs? There's, well, it's two times two times two. Any takers? How many different, 
How many different possible inputs are there? Eight. Eight, very good. Good, now if there's eight inputs and a rule takes an input and maps it to either white or black, okay? It takes one of the, for each of these eight inputs, I have a potential output of white or black. How many different possible rules are there? Anybody? Oh, is, is it going in chat? Is that what I'm missing? 256 is correct. Two to the eighth is correct. All right, I'll just keep the chat open. You guys like to text instead of speak. That's cool, that's cool. That is correct, it's two to the eighth. But this was also a bit of a trick question. Uh, it is two to the eighth, two times two to eight times. Of those that creates 256 possible rules, it turns out, that is the correct answer. It turns out that of those rules, um, some of them are basically the same rule, but like switched white for black or left, right or whatever. Uh, there are 88 rules that are different from each other, distinct. Here they are. And here they're plotted so that the most basic boring ones are at the bottom and small, right? They're just the same thing. We, we're starting, we're always going to start with a single black cell in the center and everything else white, 25 each side. What do we see? This is Bobo Framsky, right? Let's try them all. So we try them all. Like, like he tried them all in NKS. We see at the bottom a lot of simple ones. Here there's something a little bit more interesting, but still very simple. These are interesting, they're patterns, they're regular patterns. This almost looks 3D, very cool. But these six up top are the only ones that have any form of like real complexity. Now what is complexity? We'll talk a little bit about it later, like some formal definitions, but basically, um, as he points out in his book, complexity is something, it's like art. You, you know it when you see it. Right? You know this is complex, you know this is complex. Maybe you're not sure about this one, 150, or this one, like maybe it repeats quickly or it makes a pattern, but you, you, we notice complexity pretty nicely. Okay, this is all standard. Now, what do you do if you want to come up with interesting insights in any field, biology, economics, history? The simplest thing you could do, this is what I wanna start with the first of the five things we're gonna talk about uh, is reinterpret cellular automaton for your domain. This is just a general mathematical framework, right? This is just nothing. This is just cellular automaton evolving. But what if you just imagine that black means something and white means something? Let's start with a simple, very simple. Let's say black, a black cell means you're wealthy. A white cell means you're poor. Okay. That's already something interesting, right? Because then we, this has come sort of become like an economy or something. And then let's introduce something really crazy. What if instead of being regular cellular automaton, what if we let them vote? We let them vote. So every row, we have a bunch of black wealthy people and white poor people. If there's more black cells, so there's more wealthy people than poor, the, the vote they could take is to redistribute. Basically everyone flips their color. Everyone who's wealthy becomes poor, everyone who's poor becomes wealthy. Nobody would vote for it, right? If, if, every, if the majority of cells are black, they wouldn't vote to switch to become white, right? So they would only vote to redistribute every other time or whatever, or, or when, it's, when, it's, uh, when it flips. So let's explore that. Here's what happens. If you take three possible things can happen if you introduce this sort of redistribution on a particular timeline. Some rules like 106, rule 106 was a boring, Boring rule, right? Look at this rule. That's not exciting. You're not going to print this out and hang it up on your wall. You're not going to write home about it and say, mom, look at this beautiful art. No, this is nothing. This is boring. But if you introduce redistribution every, say, 25 steps or every even one time step, every single time, wow, there's becomes to be something interesting. We have the complexity where we had no complexity before, right? It looks as if redistribution Socialism, communism is creating beautiful, wonderful complexity. Thank God, this is wonderful. And it happens also for 134, right? 20, every 25, not so much, but every one, excellent. That's not the only thing that can happen, right? What else can happen? Complexity could be born, but it could also die. If you look at say rules 30 and 45, they were complex by themselves. But if you redistribute every 25 times, you can think of this as like voting, like elections. Imagine if we had presidential elections, instead of every four years, we had them every week, right? Or if we, whatever, what would happen? One quick thing that seems to happen is 
the more frequently you redistribute, the more frequently you vote, the complexity dies. In some cases, in the previous slide, we saw that it can be reborn for nothing, right? From, from total garbage, we've created a complex economy because we redistributed. But here we had a complex economy and now it dies. Make sense? So it could be born, it could die. Or the third thing that can happen is it could just be different. Uh, if you take rule 110, which happens to be uh, universal, uh, if anything that can be computed by any computational system on earth can be computed by rule 110 just by changing the initial conditions. Um, so it's very, very complex. It's maximally complex. Uh, if you redistribute 25, one, whatever, it's still complex. It's different complexity. If you're a particular person, you might prefer one path over, over another, but it's different complexity. So far, makes sense? Now, you think that makes sense. And you might think, well, what's the conclusion? Sometimes it creates complexity. Sometimes redistribution destroys complexity. And sometimes it alters it. We learned nothing. So yeah, there could be more, there could be less. What's the big deal? In fact, there is a guaranteed conclusion here, a, a actual policy implication. What, what is it? If you take cellular automaton and then you can either, and then you redistribute, let's say every, every, every day, every day you redistribute, every black cell becomes white, every white becomes black. What have we learned? That from some rules, we can create complexity. For some rules, we destroy complexity. And for some rules, we change the complexity. I, I, I claim that we just learned something really interesting. The outcome so is I would argue that without understanding our system well, that we can't say whether or not complexity will result or not. Uh, not quite. Th that would be a, a semi-interesting non-result, right? That we don't know. I, I'm, I claim we know something. In fact, I claim, this is going to blow your mind, from just what you've seen so far, we can conclude that redistribution is a bad idea. Not just might be good, might be definitely a bad idea. Proven. Can I possibly say that? Redistribution introduces uncertainty. Uh, you couldn't, um, you can make that argument. And if there was no other uh, finding, that would be fine. But it's even more than that. It's not just uncertainty, it's literally death. Patterns are repeated. Sometimes patterns are repeated, but sometimes they uh, just are altered. And sometimes they actually introduce complexity, right? Since there's not a guaranteed good outcome, there will be some risk and definite bad outcomes. Sarah, what do you mean by that? So if you know that you can't necessarily predict that the level of complexity that you want will happen, then you know that some of the level of complexity you get won't line up with your goals. So then if you don't know how to predict it properly, then you will end up with something, at least in part, unfavorable. Or at least that's what I'm reading from it. I think, I think everything you said is correct. You can go even further. It's not just the uncertainty. Think about um, when would redistribution be tested? In what conditions? For what kinds of rules? Forecasting does not work here as we get used to it. No, for, forecasting is fine. Uh, well, it's we have the principle of computational reducibility, so you can't forecast other than just simulating, but we could simulate it as far as we want. Think about the different rules. For what rules do we destroy complexity? The rules must have been originally complex, right? Repeated distribution brings to a fixed point that is death. No, it doesn't um, because uh, this is this doesn't bring death. Right? This redistribution just alters the complexity. And this one actually introduces complexity where there was none before. People would only vote, people would only vote to redistribute if it destroys complexity. That's interesting, Sophia. Um, I don't know if that's true. That would be a great follow-up study to look into when would people vote if they looked further ahead than just a current row. Um, but let me, let me uh, give you a hint. 
there's three possibilities, right? Altered death or birth. Which of these economies are strong enough to even attempt redistribution? Right, what does it mean to do redistribution? That means they have, you have a certain level of society and discussion, right? It's reasonable to think, okay, look at this society. It's complex. It's interesting. Let's have a vote. Let's see what happens, right? And here, look, here we took a vote and it turned out poorly. Okay, we're all dead. These things happen. But what about this? These are not even economies. These are like ant farms or something or, or plants. They're not, they don't, they can't, they don't have enough complexity to vote. Does that make sense? You need, if the economy is not complex to start with, can you give me an example of a society that decided to redistribute wealth and went from being very simple to becoming very complex? It doesn't happen, right? You have to have a certain society that exists already, a certain complexity, otherwise you're dead. And dead economies don't vote. Does that make sense? So of these three sentences, they're all true, except that this would, the sometimes that creates complexity would never happen in the real world. The real world must start from a complex beginning, a rule that generates complex behavior at first, right? If it's already complex, then there's not three possibilities. There's only two possibilities. It might alter the complexity a little bit. And then Sophia's question comes into play, right? We have to decide and all this other stuff. It might alter it, okay. Or the only other alternative is death. In other words, things could be more or less the same, kind of no big deal, or you've destroyed the entire society. There's no way to become better. Does that make sense? And isn't that interesting? It's, this is nothing, it's just black and white cells. And the Paul Wolframsky approach here is just to put an interpretation on the black and white cells and maybe tweak it a little bit with the voting. Make sense? Okay, let me give you a uh, a history lesson of all of finance and economics. Are you ready? In like five minutes. Uh, there's, we've undergone, we're, we're, there's been basically three revolutions in finance. The first one, you know, every, every hero, every superhero story needs like an origin story, right? So the origin story of traditional conventional finance is that uh, we all had no idea what to do with our money. Along came Harry Markowitz, drew us this graph, and suddenly we were all enlightened and knew how to invest. Uh, that's not too far from the truth, but it's obviously like all origin stories, a little bit exaggerated for effect. Um, the truth is there was another person at that time, Arthur D. Roy. Has anyone here ever heard of Arthur D. Roy? Not all at once. No, no one's heard of Arthur D. Roy. When no. um, someone heard of Arthur D. Roy? No, I'm saying no, I did not. Oh. <laughs> uh, when Markowitz got his Nobel Prize, uh, he's a very gracious person. He was writing in his acceptance speech or whatever that is. Uh, Arthur D. Roy wrote an article very similar to uh, what Markowitz wrote in 1952, the same year, but with some differences. And uh, Markowitz later reflecting on it says, comparing the two articles, this is a lesson for everybody here who does research, by the way, comparing the two articles, one might wonder why I got a Nobel Prize for mine and Roy did not for his. He says the most likely reason is visibility to the committee in 1990, 40 years later. Roy's 1952 article was his first and last article in finance. He made this one tremendous contribution and disappeared from the field. Whereas I kept writing and I was whatever. Uh, and he's a very gracious person, Mark. He says, I'm often called the father of modern portfolio theory, but Roy can claim equal share of this honor. Isn't that nice? Now, what did Roy do? Uh, in his paper, Roy introduced a lot of the concepts that modernly we would use to talk about finance that were much more quantitative than Markowitz's. Uh, the idea of the sharp ratio, the concepts of value at risk, to put mean and standard deviation on the axes instead of mean and variance, which when it goes on which axes, uh, the idea of having a tangency portfolio, the possibility of short selling, the covariance matrix, all of these things were actually in Roy's paper. Um, okay, but that's fine. What was the origin story for behavioral finance. Uh, there, uh, uh, Robert Schiller uh, wrote a book which came out on March, I think it was 9th, 2000. 
And as soon as it hit the bookstores, do you guys remember bookstores from your youth before there was like Amazon? Like you would go to us anyway. People immediately rushed to the bookstores, saw this on the shelves, read it, and started dumping the internet stocks, and the bubble collapsed. Right? That's the beautiful original origin story. Um, uh, the truth is a little bit more nuanced. It is true. Yeah, certainly he was one of the uh, most important contributors, but also there are others like Kahneman, Tversky, Thaler. There's lots of books about uh, behavioral finance over time. Um, now, conventional, I'm going to say a lot of things now that are uh, caricatures. Uh, but why do we do caricatures? Why do you go to a, uh, a city and have someone draw a caricature of you? So you can see, you know, which of your features really stand out, right? You know, it's not really you. So these are also cartoonish. Um, conventional finance, the, the cartoons are also, you know, they're intentionally a little bit insulting, right? See the previous slide for a sec. Sure. This one? Oh, and uh, Erez, so this is being recorded, right? Um, and I'm happy to upload the slides. Yes. Also, whatever, whatever's happening. Excellent. It's great. Um, okay, so conventional finance to, if you had to insult an entire field of study, conventional finance, how would you insult it? And by the way, this is the way lovingly people within the field insult it themselves, right? They would say, oh, it's all an exercise in just multiple regression. It's just multiple linear regression. That's all it is. Um, uh, that's the caricature. Now, the way conventional finance works, it's contributions. It takes its data. It's very, very clean data. Uh, the Chicago Research Center for Security Prices was founded by FAM in 1960, and it was very clean. Like, how, do you, how can you analyze finance until you know what the stock prices are? Very good. Um, the primary methods, the, the primary approach that uh, conventional finance takes is to look at all stocks basically, and sort them and break them up into deciles, top 10%, bottom, second 10, and so on, and then compare the top to the bottom. That's a very standard kind of approach. And see if by whatever factor, if you can sort stocks by, I don't know, astrological sign of the CEO, the number of the times they use the letter E, anything, and you find and you create deciles, and then you see if there's a substantial difference, you've created a risk factor, come get your Nobel Prize. Their main techniques are regressions, fine. Um, and the way it works is you first, you, you come up with a regular regression so that a stock's excess return has its own alpha. Eventually you get rid of the I and you start moving to adding uh, additional factors, not just the market, but uh, small minus big, high minus low, and eventually momentum. You add your own factor here, you're a legend. That's, that's the world of conventional finance as a caricature. Behavioral finance looks like this. It's it's basically this one slide on the right, this picture. Uh, people have biases, people are fools. Uh, if you go to this stand, this Jew stand, and I think it was Buenos Aires, uh, if you're a foreigner, it's like an economist, a traditional economist might explain this as a price discrimination, right? For the, uh, for the stupid foreigner who reads the English sign, oh, orange juice, I'll pay $5. Great, you're extracting more from the dumb foreigners, the dumb rich foreigner, whereas if you're a local, and you're able to somehow decipher what jugo de naranja means, very confusing, then you can get away with the low, low price of $4. Now you come to the stand, you see some people paying four and getting a glass, some people paying five and getting a glass, right? It's not, the, there's, there's a big picture here. It's not, they're not different glasses, it's all the same. Uh, but the fact that this continues to exist uh, is uh, the essence of behavioral economics and behavioral finance. Um, the data that behavioral finance brings in addition, over and above, so all these build on each other. You need the clean stock price data, of course, but in addition, uh, they look at surveys and, and, and research and ask people questions and see if that's related to, uh, to, to forecastable and interesting insights. The main approach there, uh, rather than sorting in deciles, is to first explain that there is something preventing smart money, smart, beautiful, wonderful, rational money, from exploiting and bringing to equilibrium any pricing discrepancy. So why doesn't somebody come in? Here's a next trick question for you. I know you guys love trick questions. Why doesn't somebody come in right now when they see this five versus four? This is a discrepancy, right? This is a pricing discrepancy. Uh, why don't arbitrageurs step in and bring those prices in line? Because they have to hold inventory. Uh, uh, what does that mean? I, I can hold inventory. Just give it to me. I'll hold it. What do you mean? 
Hire me for your profits. I'll sit there holding your inventory. You're, you're close though, Paul. What is it that's preventing you from going down to this stand in Buenos Aires and somehow eliminating the opportunity? Imperfect information. What is it that you don't know? Yes, I agree, Paul. You need to pay for storage, refrigeration. Yes, but there is a certain, there's costs to it, but this is such a huge discrepancy. There's a 25% price gap. You'll never see this in the real world. What about the local maybe. nature of the business? Say again? The local nature of the business. What's wrong with it being local? Uh, I'm saying like if you have two stands on the other side of town, they can't compete against each other. Okay, so come just to this stand. Suppose it's just one stand. What's preventing you from arbitraging away the market imperfection? There's some practical limitations, like, you know, the juice seller will see me doing this and then will, like, not sell to me, right? Uh, okay, that's one possibility. Good, that's a, I hadn't thought about that one. Yes, that's one friction, is he might not like you. <laughs> uh, suppose, that, uh, what else? What else is there? You could just stand there and translate. Well, uh, so, Paul, suppose you do stand there and translate. Are they going to pay you? Sophia, that's true. Individuals do have different willingness to pay. That's exactly right. That's the standard economics argument is, look, this is a brilliant marketing device by this fruit juice vendor to extract greater rents from the, from the foreigners. That's exactly how CVS and every supermarket makes extra money, right? If you come to a supermarket and you're not a member of their super secret wonderful club, you're paying like a million times more than otherwise, right? But if you're a local, and right, that's, that's how they get to price discrimination. Um, but in this case, uh, in, in this case, even if you're willing to pay more, you don't have to, right? It's right there. There's no, you don't need a super secret membership card. Uh, others doing arbitrage will undercut you quickly. Uh, that could happen, but until then, let's make money, right? Um, what is preventing, suppose there's no other arbitrage yours, it's just you. What's preventing you from doing arbitrage? Market exists because of arbitrage. The seller has no obligation to negotiate. You don't need to negotiate. Arbitrage is not about negotiation, right? If you see a stock selling for $5 and the same stock selling elsewhere for $4, do you need anyone's approval? You do need to have $4, that's true, potentially. What else do you need to have? There's, there's something else that you need to be able to do, which you cannot do. How would you, how would you arbitrage a stock price? You can't set prices, that's okay. You can't set price in the stock market either. If you see a stock selling for $5 on one exchange and $4 for another, how would you make money there? You need to be credible, you need rich dunk. Michael, Michael, Michael for the win. You have to be able to borrow. That's exactly right. You could borrow the stock presumably and sell it. How are you gonna borrow a glass of orange juice? and then sell it to the next person in line. You can't. So that's a limit to arbitrage. There are some things that prevent you from being able to uh, follow along and make money from everybody. Fine. So that's the basic thing that behavioral finance does. It, it, first, it explains why there are some limits and then says, okay, so now we have some limits. There's a wedge. There's a possibility for mispricing. Let's explore what causes that mispricing. Uh, the main technique by which they approach it rather than uh, regressions is they look for theories of how people make decisions loss aversion, prospect theory, all the rest of it. Great. Um, and they find different kinds of anomalies, uh, pricing anomalies and even um, uh, behavioral anomalies. One of the biggest behavioral anomalies, by the way, is that people just trade too much. There's no reason for that. There's probably too many uh, mutual funds, right? Why do we need to have more mutual fund managers than there are stocks? It's not that hard to create a portfolio. Buy a little of this, buy a little of that, right? All right, that's behavioral finance. Um, some, some questions overlap between them. So for example, the question of momentum. So that stocks that have gone up tend to continue going up. Stocks that have gone down tend to continue going down. That's an empirical, more or less established fact. But why does that happen? That's where they differ. Is it a bias? 
Is there some psychological reason we love winners and hate losers? Maybe. Or is it a risk factor that even though it's, we don't have any particular emotional attachment to any of them, the, the, we, it correlates with our own personal in, uh, life in a way that it causes us to price it as a systemic risk factor. Um, if you go to Chicago uh, and you land, don't go to uh, O'Hare, go to Midway get to University of Chicago, you go to the Booth School of Business, you go up to the fourth floor, you'll come to the end of the hall. And at the end of the hall, there's, there's two corner offices, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, and in the middle, there's li literally a blocking uh, fire exit, but it's not even one you can get into. It's from a pre upstairs floors to get down in the case of a fire. So it's literally blocking these two offices. In one office, you have Richard Thaler, behavioral economics. And the other side, you have Eugene Fama, rational economics. And they disagree, right? One says markets are efficient, the other says markets are inefficient. Um, and they argue and it's wonderful. And they, but they can't even communicate. Uh, so the question is how can we break down that wall? Do we think markets are efficient or inefficient? What, what would you say? Just shout it out, unmute yourself or chat or whatever. Do you think markets are basically efficient or there's sometimes when there's inefficiencies? Inefficient. Gaurav goes for option C. Neither efficient nor inefficient. Not efficient, sometimes, inefficient, inefficient, good. Uh, depends on the efficient to the mood. Ooh, Sophia, uh, very interesting. Um, I'll tell you how finance professors answer this question. Now this is obviously a biased sample. This was a survey of 4,500 finance professors. I didn't know there were that many finance professors on earth. Uh, but they surveyed them. And it turns out that 90% of them believe that the markets are efficient. I, I agree with you. I think if they were always efficient, why would we need so many finance professors? Um, I'm going to switch gears for one second, but it'll, it'll make sense in, in, in two seconds. Um, forget everything we just said. Let's just talk about computational complexity. What? What's computational complexity? Uh, you've probably heard of PNNP. P are, is the class of problems that are relatively easy to solve like sorting or multiplying or testing for primes. And NP is the class of problems that are easy to verify. Like if I gave you a solution, you could quickly check that it worked, a traveling salesman or satisfiability. Uh, can you factor this number? If you can, then you can break uh, encryption codes. Um, any, any guesses? I checked the number two, and I, but I didn't bother checking three and nine. So it could be divisible by three or nine. There's just too many digits for me to count. But factoring numbers is a hard problem. Multiplying numbers is an easy problem. Okay. So the, there's two classes of computational complexity. One question you might ask is, uh, just like we were talking about market efficiency or inefficiency, let's talk about computational inefficiency. Now, like with everything else, the Simpsons did it first. The first time Homer became 3D, uh, he was wandering around this world where he had uh, some wonderful equations, one of which said P equals NP. So that was a prediction. Uh, it hasn't come true yet, but well, maybe it's true. We just don't know the proof or, or constructive proof. If P were to equal NP, meaning if you could e as quickly solve as you can verify, uh, that would end all cryptography. Um, yes, sure. Uh, uh, Peter Shore's quantum algorithm can factor numbers quickly uh, with quantum computation. Um, let's, let's leave that aside, or we'll talk about that afterwards. Uh, but anyway, if you could prove P equals NP, that would be a, a miraculous world. That would be the greatest single innovation in the history of the world by our species or any other species. Because you can read these quotes, but in short, if you can recognize genius, you can generate genius. So if you can if you say, yeah, this is a Mozart, that's enough to be able to generate new Mozart. Awesome. Which we're not that far away from doing now, are we? With deep learning and stuff. Okay. If you survey people in computer science and math, um, let's ask you guys, what do you think? Does P equal NP? No, no. No, that seems pretty unanimous. All right, so no, fine, I agree. And most, most computer science and math people say, no, it can't be. It's very unlikely. That, that would be un unbelievably amazing. But here's the amazing thing, is that finance professors say that uh, finance people, markets are efficient. Math people say some computation is hard. Those two statements, it turns out, can't both be true. Uh, and the, the paper that I wrote for this was the foundational paper for this journal that we launched, Algorithmic Finance. If you squint really hard, you can see that Stephen uh, Wolfram is on the advisory board. Um, the idea is if we think of markets are efficient as a sort of ho-hum 
uh, assumption in finance. But it's not ho-hum at all. If markets are efficient, then P equals NP. And if P equals NP, then markets are efficient. Um, yes, efficient enough is a very good way of putting it. You off. OK. Uh, now, uh, what is algorithmic or computational finance? How does it work? It works through heuristics. Uh, it works through Wolframsky, right, from the bottom up rather than the top down. The data tends to look at as very high frequency. The approach is to create simple rules and see, explore, where do they go? Uh, and the techniques are borrowed from computer science. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. Um, I'll give you three comparisons just so you can understand the difference. In terms of risk, the conventional approach is that the market determines the risk factors. Fine. The behavioral approach is that psychology determines the risk factors. Okay. What would be the algorithmic or computational approach? It might be that the risk factors are themselves uncomputable. There's no guarantee we know all the answers, right? This is the principle of computational reducibility and everything else, and it, right? It's, it may just not have an answer. For regulation, uh, this is some work that uh, my dad, Zach, and I did. Conventionally, the conventional explanation would be that regulation should have no effect. Uh, I forgot who I heard say this. I think it might've been Mark Rubenstein, um, that any finite, tax code will generate zero revenue. Does that sentence make sense to you? If the laws for income taxes are fixed and printed, and here's what they are, meaning there's some exceptions here, some loopholes there, then eventually everyone will find all the loopholes and nobody will do it. Um, that's the conventional approach. That regulation should do nothing. Go out good. Behavioral approach is that regulation should work, right? People are not optimal and they could be tweaked to be better. Okay. And the, what we found to be true in the, using the algorithmic and computational approach is that regulation will in fact backfire. If you try to create a, an environment, a society where there is less systemic risk, for example, you will actually cause more systemic blow ups than would have otherwise happened. It backfires. And finally, in finance. The conventional approach is there is no alpha, meaning there's no outsized extra returns. You can just go out there and grab money. There's no alpha. Instead, how should you invest your money? Put it all in Vanguard, right? Some passive index funds. The behavioral approach would say there's actually negative alpha. You, Mr. or Ms. Retail Investor, are so bad at trading that you uh, generate negative alpha, largely from transactions costs, but even beyond that, you, you tend to buy when it's the worst time to buy and you tend to sell when it's the worst time to sell, you should just stop trading. So they actually give the same recommendation, right? For different reasons, but the same recommendation. The algorithmic and com computational approach is different though. It says that, you know, we know from P equals NP and everything else, there might be something out there. You might be wrong if you think there is, right? You, you might've found something that you thought was right, but it turns out not. But there may in fact be positive alpha and there are returns to looking for that golden goose. Okay. How are we doing? Good? All right, so I mentioned I'd go back to this uh, minimal model of financial complexity. Here we go, it's a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, as you watch these, uh, this is moving for you too, right? It's not just on my screen, I'm not hallucinating. All right, so as you watch, whoops, as you watch these prices, these are, what do we know about the nature of financial prices? They're uh, relatively random, they sometimes go up and down. They're not pure white noise, right? Sometimes you have long, uh, momentum seeming things. Sometimes you have bigger drops than you would otherwise guess. If you want to trade, just go ahead and shout out or type anytime. What would you, would you do? Buy here, sell here? What would you do? Buy or sell? Quick, quick. What do you do? Uh, one thing you can do is uh, don't be fooled by the tops and bottoms, right? This is just the most recent. Just because it's at the bottom doesn't mean it can't go lower. Just because it's at the top doesn't mean it can't go higher. Uh, one thing you could do is play cursor arbitrage and move it to where you want it to be and hope that you're right. But in any case, you see the big drops. You see everything else happening. Um, I see no buyers or sellers in the chat. Anybody want to buy or sell? No. So the, these are, uh, that was not in fact a random walk. It looked like this. This is the entire history you saw. We were kind of moving out with our small window. Not only is it not a random walk, right? Because it has these big consistent moves, right? It's crazy. It's actually completely deterministic and repetitive. Look at this pattern, for example. This repeats. This was generated, uh, and this was generated by the model that I'll show you about now, the, the minimal model. Now, if you look at pure random walks, just you go up or down, left to right, equal probability, these are what those things look like. You've seen these before. These are relatively normal looking, right? Normal in, in, the, uh, in every sense. That's 
uh, that's external randomness, something affecting you. Internal randomness would be randomness you generate deterministically, but just from who you are. Kind of, you could think of chaos theory. Now, suppose we want to do this. We want, we want to explore this sense of internal randomness. What would be the absolute smallest possible model? Do we need to have a lot of traders? Feels like we do, right? To have a market, you need at least two traders, presumably. And even two might not be enough because you need some competition. So maybe three, right? How many assets do we need? People have to choose among assets, don't they? Right? You have to probably maybe two, maybe again, the same reason, three. How much computing power? Do, do traders need to be able to forecast in advance or do all sorts of complicated mathematics? Um, how much memory do they store? What's their internal states? And ultimately, when we do it, will we end up looking like white noise or we will look at real markets? Real markets have complicated hair and annoying features like, uh, uh, like momentum or autocorrelation or skewness or kurtosis. So what do you think? What would be the minimal model? How many traders doing it? How many assets? Minimal. Anything lower than that, you'd be like, no, that's not a market. What I'll suggest is we can do it with just one trader, one asset. And it generates realistic complexity. It's pretty amazing. This is what it is. This is the model. Um, it's uh, according to the, the Wolfram numbering system of rules. This is rule 54. It's uh, essentially unique. Here's how it works. This is a model of the mental state of the representative investor trading a single asset. What's a representative investor? That's a standard thing in economics. A representative investor is someone we presume exists who uh, represents the entire market. Uh, but let's, let's walk him through his day. What does a representative investor do? He wakes up on Thursday and he sees that Monday the market was down, Tuesday it was up, and Wednesday it was up working backwards for you know, recent first, he follows these arrows. So he always starts in state one. Every morning he wakes up, hits the alarm, he's in state one. Hello world, I'm ready to go. In state one, he, he starts looking, so I remind me what happened the past three days. So yesterday the market was up. Okay, I'll follow my up arrow. All right, so I'm going up. The thing to the right of the arrow that he's following is his current inclination. He, after looking at just Wednesday, he's thinking he's probably gonna sell. I'm probably gonna sell today. All right, but I'm not done. I need to look three back. So that was one. Now let me look Tuesday. Tuesday was also up. Okay, I'll follow the same arrow again. I'm still inclined to sell. That's where I'm leaning. I'm going to sell. I'm going to sell. Now what happened Monday? Monday was down and oh, that's not this arrow. That's this one. I followed this down arrow. Now I happen to be in state two, but it doesn't matter anymore. That was the last thing I looked at. And my last inclination is to buy. So what does a representative investor do? He woke up early. He, he did his whole homework. It's 9.15. He's calling his broker. He says, broker, buy the market. I'm in. I want to buy it. Broker's like, hang on, hang on. I'll put in your order. I'll call you back. Calls back. Oh, sorry, the market moved away from you. You missed it by that much. So what happens with a representative investor? The market goes up in price on zero volume. That's what, and he's disappointed every day. He just barely missed uh, buying it. He never actually buys or sells, but he does move the market. So if you understood that, here's your pop quiz. When he wakes up on Friday, hits the alarm, st starts in state one, and he sees the last three days were what? Tuesday was up, Wednesday was up. What was Thursday? No, nope, not down, Sarah. I guess I can't give the answer. What else could it be? <laughs> it's because he followed, remember, this arrow, this arrow, and then Monday he followed the down arrow left. Yes, he followed the down arrow. So he bought, he called his broker to buy. And the broker said, sorry, the market moved away from you. It moved up in price, but you didn't get to, the chance to buy it at the low price. Does that make sense? So the price actually did go, whoops, potential security concern. Um, Thursday, pop, good. Uh, formally, it's an uh, uh, iterated finite automaton. It, it looks like this, you give it, you have your current state, you have an input and you have the state you're going to and the new output. This is your inclination in our sense. How many possible states are there? Well, we know it can't just be one state because then it would just follow around itself. So you need at least two states. How many outputs? You have to either be able to buy or sell. That's the minimal. Uh, and that's also the number of inputs. Uh, and how many different possible uh, models are there? It would be K to the S times K to the S, so uh, four to the fourth power. 
So if we try them all, um, uh, it turns out that this one, that 52 one that I showed is the only one that generates complexity. None of the others do. But what is complexity? Um, there was once a, a paper by Seth Lloyd, he was from MIT. Um, is he still there? The complexity and non-exhaustive list. He gave 40 definitions of complexity. Um, in our case, we can just look that, we know that if we're looking out n days, or, uh, uh, if, we're, if we're looking back three days, the, the process must cycle within two to the th uh, third, right? So it'd be eight days. So uh, that's the one I showed you before, it's cycled, right? But we can say it, um, uh, it cycles for a very long window uh, and we'll say it's complex if it's more than half its length. So uh, if, if the window length is 15, then the cycle age is already too, you know, it's, it's more than the age of the universe in seconds. So it's fine, we can make it big enough. Uh, we, we wanna look back at least five because otherwise it's just too simple. Uh, if we try them all, um, we find that of the 256 possible rules, only one effectively unique one is complex. If we add a third state where he, the representative investor could buy, sell, or hold, then uh, there's 46,000 such rules. Only 270 of them are complex. Complexity is rare. This is something that's pretty consistent across everything I've ever seen. As we saw in cellular automaton, complexity is rare, but it does happen. And the only way to find it is Paul Wolframski. Check them all, right? You have to check them all. There's no other way to do it. Uh, here's what those look like, those 270. They look pretty complex. Um, Another interesting thing about rule 54 is that it's consistent no matter what your look back window, this is the uh, uh, transition diagram. So each of these are like a particular state. You can see that th they make big circles uh, and the complexity goes back. The percentage of the maximum complexity, no matter what your look back window, with a few exceptions here and there, always above 50% and often close to 99 or 100%. In other words, this is the most maximally complex possible uh, output. Okay, that's fine. That's all com computational. Let's bring it back to the real world. What does it look like? Here's what they look like. Big gaps, sometimes seeming momentum. So there's already the interesting autocorrelative patterns that we wouldn't otherwise see in white noise. Uh, the histogram, you can see it has a negative skewness. It has some kurtosis and we can measure it for however, however parameters we wanna choose. The skewness is negative. Kurtosis is positive. Every feature that we hate about the real world markets seems to come out from here. It's, it comes out directly. Um, it, it doesn't come out with random white noise. The minimal model of complexity actually, the minimal model of financial trading generates the realistic complexity that we see. And the most beautiful thing about this kind of approach in general and also here, there's no parameters to tweak. If, you're, if your model of the market is it has a certain volatility and a certain alpha, right, or mu, you could tweak the mu and the sigma until it's close to fit. You can't tweak these, how, what are you gonna change it from rule 54 to rule 55? Suddenly it's nothing, it does nothing. Um, you can change the number of states, but that changes everything. You can change the number of possible actions, but that changes everything. Um, so there's nothing to tweak. In a sense, you're, you're finding real stuff here. That's the beauty of, uh, of this approach of going simple models first. Okay, this is my favorite one. You ready? Uh, have you got, do you guys know Gilligan's Island or no? It's a show about 50 years ago. Um, unfortunately, all of them have now passed, except for Ginger. She's the last one still alive. Marianne just passed away from COVID, unfortunately, about a week ago, two weeks ago. Um, so here's a, the, I think this is the last pop quiz question for you. Are you ready for this? Imagine you have five people. These are the five passengers. And you want to see how many different kinds of contracts can they enter into? What's a contract? A contract could be between two or more people. So uh, if I'm giving you a haircut, that's a contract between the two of us. But if I also have the owner of the shop where I'm giving you a haircut, that's a contract between three people. That's a tri-party contract, right? How many different contracts are there among five people? Oh, there is. If you've only seen Gilligan's Island by Pop Reference, you should, you should watch it. They're fun. There's great sitcoms, They're wonderful. They don't make them like that anymore. And they don't make them in that quantity either. They have like, I don't know, 80 episodes a year. Uh, how many possible contracts are there? Five factorial is close, not quite. It's, it's a lot less than five factorial because the contract, remember, it doesn't matter the order, right? So how many different contracts are there? 31 is very close. Lewis, how did you get to 31? Um, uh, I did kind of like uh, Pascal's triangle. So, and I, two to the fifth, I took, I subtracted one because that would be a, a one-person contract. That would be an empty contract. 
So I'm not sure. I must have missed something else. You're very close. Mads, why is it? Oh, Eggman and Mads, who wants to go? Why is it 26? Oh, again, Pascal's triangle, but the five zero, the combination com matrix of five to zero and five to one are subtracted. So only two and more people combination groups of people remain. Perfect. That's exactly right. We don't care about one person contracts. That's not a contract. And we don't care about zero. So there's 26 possible contracts. Uh, here's all the 26 possible contracts that could be. Uh, it could be between uh, two people, three, four, or all five. Make sense? Um, okay. Now here's the way to think Paul Wolframski. Uh, remember, there's, there's two different ways of doing it. One is take something like cellular automata and interpret it, what's black, what's white. The alternative approach is start with the, the essence, the simplest possible thing. Let's start with contracts, right? Contracts are what generate wealth. Um, if we have 26 contracts that could potentially at any point, any one of them could be consummated, how many different possible states of the world are there? Meaning we have one state of the world where none of them, none of the contracts are live. We have one state where three of those particular ones are live. We have one where all of them are live. How many different possible states altogether are there? Each of the 26 contracts could be either on or off. Two to the 26, perfect. That's exactly right. Uh, two to the 26, 67 million. Um, how does one state evolve into the next? Well, iterated finite automaton, same as the minimal financial models to the rescue. Look at, these are all of the iterated finite automata, all possible rules. Uh, can you find the one that's complex? You really have to squint. It's not any of these white ones. It's not any of these gray ones. But if you see this guy, you see this? It's hard to tell, but there's actually something complex going on in that one. Um, that is the only complex when it looks like this. We won't go through it, but that's it's the same iterated finite automaton. And here, each column goes to here and then starts at the top again. You can see the evolution is complex, right? You, see, you know it when you see it. So this is the minimal model of economic complexity. Fine. Now what? Now let's introduce communism again. So how do we measure wealth? Wealth would be... Uh, after a certain point, you've been in some number of contracts. How many contracts have you ever been part of? That's your individual wealth. The GDP is the total number of active contracts at any given point. And what is communism? We're in general big government. It means that you can't exit. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Let's look at this first one. That's, this is the American rattlesnake, you know, don't tread on me. In the American rattlesnake economy, which is just a regular economy, exactly what we just saw, that evolution, the GDP is volatile, but grows. There's risk, but there's reward. Individuals, there are some people who are wealthier than others, but they're all growing. There is an income gap and there's a distribution. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. There are sometimes people in poverty who have very little contracts or zero, right? It's rare, but it happens. Now, what if we have a benevolent government that says, you know what? We're going to offer you some services. We're going to do some stuff. What is government like that? It means you can't exit. You don't have to go into a contract with it, but once you do, you can't exit. So let's designate individual one to be the government that once you enter into a contract with the government, you can never get out. What happens now to the GDP? Oh, just the private GDP. Don't worry about their money, right? That's, they're just going to blow it on whatever they spend it on. The private GDP, pure randomness, no growth. Individual wealth, the government gets really, really wealthy. Everyone else is poor. The income gap is smaller though. Yay. We're all bankrupt. Wonderful. Thank you, communism. And poverty is much more frequent and much more widespread. Just a little twist, right? All you, all you do is make the model, twist it up, and you can create a, a, a very broad general conclusion that yes, big government not only causes, but also exacerbates poverty. So we've learned redistribution is bad, big government is bad. Um, let me just show you the last, this is literally the last thing. Uh, and this is live. So let me see, can you see my other screen? Can you see this screen that it's Wolfram? Okay, yes. this is something my dad and I were working on uh, literally this morning and yesterday. Um, this is for, uh, we want to ultimately ask the, a question about COVID lockdown. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? How can we do it? Um, and I just wanted to show you how simple it is to uh, attempt these kinds of questions when you think Paul Wolframski. 
first we think, well, what is a society? Well, it's a collection of people. Every person is either happy or not happy, but sometimes they also die. So there's technically three states, right? But once you're dead, that's an absorbing state. You're never going to be happy from there either any, anymore. Also, we don't care about which of our neighbors. We have some certain neighborhood that we care about of our live neighbors. We don't care about our dead neighbors. Of our live neighbors, meaning ignoring all the ones that are dead in between, we just look at the total, their total happiness. So we have their total happiness. Uh, if the radius is, let's say, one, then we look to the left, look to the right. There's how many different possible happinesses level. It could go from zero, they're both unhappy, all the way up to uh, uh, three. Oh, all the way up to two. So it's zero, one, and two. So there's three possibilities. And there's two possibilities for my happiness. So it's two times three. For each of those, I can now transition into a state of either be continuing to be happy or alive but sad or dead. So it's three to that power. So for a radius of one, there's 729 rules. Let's evolve it for one step, evolve it for many steps with the nest list. Uh, start it with one happy dude surrounded by on the left, 100 sad but living dudes and 100 sad but living dudes on the other side. Try them for all possible 729 rules. Only five of them end up being complex and they're all interestingly different complex. This is where we left off now, but the next steps would be, well, look at this guy, by the way. This fifth one, there's only, well, the middle guy dies. He's the only one who ever dies. Everyone else just fluctuates between happiness and sad in a complex manner. Uh, the next stage would be to uh, imagine what if COVID hits and kills everybody over a certain age measured by their length of happiness or something versus what if government steps in and reduces your neighborhood, lockdown, quarantine, what happens to the complexity then? Does all that make sense? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm two minutes over. But I'm happy to stay as long as you want. Whatever questions or discussions you guys would like to talk about. Well, first of all, I'm trying to find how I can uh, virtually clap. <laughs> Here, clap. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Maimon. Maybe uh, we'll take some audience questions, see if people have. Uh, do you want to keep going on the lockdown for another few minutes? Uh, yeah, while we're waiting for questions, I'll just keep programming. That's cool. Let's, let's do a crowdsource. Do I have a blog or website? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll type my website. Really hard to, oh, that's, wow. Perez, you're faster than I am, impressive. I don't yes. type Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing we, we are working on now, and it's, it's funny to say this, uh, this is almost embarrassing to admit. Um, we're not too happy with these colors. <laughs> So if you have that, right, this one's a little bit hard to see. So we've tr been trying different colors to make it look, you know, a little bit more distinguishable. Um, if you have suggestions for better colors, the, the, it's kind of funny. But on the other hand, if you end up spending most of your time in developing a model by deciding little questions like colors and where to put the labels, that's actually good, right? Because you're going to spend that amount of time on it anyway. But that means you, everything else is really fast. And the Wolfram language makes really everything super fast. A lot of built-in things, wonderful. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on any topic. We have a question so This here. is sort of, yeah, so this is, I'm not sure you can hear me. This is sort of related to like the markets I've talked about earlier, I guess in general. Um, is it true that like knowing that a simple deterministic automata could generate the complexity we see in the markets, doesn't that not necessarily tell us where necessarily to find the positive excess returns or alphas since maybe like the real data generating process corresponds to, I don't know, like a stochastic uh, finite automaton or even like a, like, a, like a superset of the simple finite model we found. Like, how do we know that the, the simple models we have just because they can generate complexity are what's generating complexity in the real world? Uh we never do. Uh, it could be any other model. It could be a tweak on this model. It could be completely different. Most likely all of the models are false, right? There's something else going on. Um, so what do we do? The, what do we use the models for? Um, if we have a model that tells us which stocks have alpha, we can evaluate it based on performance, right? Uh, but if we have other questions that we'd like to ask, this, this answers the question of uh, where does the complexity in the markets come from? Is it because necessarily the fundamentals of the economy are crazy and, and complex and kurtosis and skewness, right? Or could it be the case that 
really factories and firms and labor, that's all relatively normal and, and nice, very white noisy kind of stuff. But the trading activity of people themselves can generate complexity. And the answer is yes, it could be that case. And then you can start extending it to multiple traders or multiple assets and see what happens from that perspective. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I know it's not a perfect answer because I'm not telling you what to buy or sell, but that's, that's the essence of finance, right? If you're studying finance and anybody in your family ever finds out you're studying finance, the only question to you is what should I buy or sell? And uh, the only thing you learn the more you study finance is other ways of avoiding answering that question. Um, Maybe I can throw a question here, if I may, yeah. uh, Dr. Maimon, and is how um, have you validated any of this on, on some real world data sets, right? That's the, the test of a model, how validated it is on, on, you know, a given stock or anything like that. Yeah, so the minimal financial model, it's uh, that it's an orthogonal and um, backwards question to see if you can make it fit. Right, this is exactly what it's not good for. If you have a top-down approach, then it's very easy to fit, but this one is not. Um, all this can do is help you explore what it might be like. That's it's truly a model. Um, that said, there are some things that we can test. Uh, one paper my dad and I wrote was about risk regulation, where it's the same approach. We start from the bottom up, but yeah, we can look at empirical data and see, is it the case that, uh, uh, stocks that have experienced, let's say, recently very, very high volatility, do they tend to go down over time? And the ones that have experienced abnormally low volatility, do they stay abnormally low? Is that just an intrinsic feature? They're just low vol? Or is it, as it, we found, it's more likely that they were randomly appearing to be safer and then their true volatility emerges. So what happens in a regulatory environment if certain stocks become regulatorily favored, even though everybody knows that's not a true intrinsic volatility, all banks will flock to them for a while, like subprime mortgages. For a while, everything will seem fine and they'll keep going up. But as soon as they rear their true ugly head of true volatility to the downside, they don't have enough capital uh, in reserve to maintain that position. So they have to sell it. They have to sell other things. The market collapse, systemic collapse. And that was caused by the very regulations that were intended to prevent that kind of collapse. So yes, there, you can do empirical tests, but it's not, um, you have to, you want to do empirical tests on what you truly are interested in, not on testing whether your model is verbatim true. It's never going to be verbatim true. Maybe one more question for me, because I have your time or something interested is, uh, what do you think about the divergence between kind of the current stock market and the underlying economy? I'm, I'm doing some work uh, uh, from a master thesis that kind of uh, shows that real industrial companies today are, are severely uh, in a very, very difficult position and have been for the last few months since COVID. But, you know, that's not really representing the stock market at all. Um, that's an excellent and deep question. I don't know the total answer. I'll give you some thoughts. Um, one, by the way, so you can read about Tesla, right? It's, it, it's worth more now than the next 10 automakers combined, or, you know, would you, it's worth more than, I mean, it's crazy stuff. Um, one thing that I'm kind of hoping might come out of this work that we're doing here with the, uh, uh, with this COVID model, um, as you reduce your neighborhoods, Right? You're restricting freedom with lockdown or quarantine or social distancing or masks or whatever it is, right? People are not as uh, networky as the, we used to be. Um, progress slows and innovation slows. And if we know we're going to live in an environment where innovation is sort of capped for a while, then who would you invest in? Would you invest in small companies that might come up with ideas? No, because you know that the rate of them coming up with new independent individual ideas is much lower. You're going to invest in the companies that have um, big moats and ideas that have been established, right? If, if we knew innovation was basically dead, was no longer available to anybody but who already had it, right? Who would you invest in? The very big market caps, Tesla, Apple, right? You know they're going to continue because they have done it and it's already built in. But an entrepreneur, a startup, a smaller company, that's one, that's a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true. Um, let's answer some, so Mads is asking why why can a complex society be reducible to simple rules? Um, that's, that's the essence of uh, the new kind of science, right? It turns out that all, 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 all complexity probably is, comes from simple rules. Um, Craig gave some code. Let's see what is this is a colored. Oh, this is good code. Let's check this out. Can you still see my screen or no? 
Wow. The best possible colors. Now that's optimal. Let's try those. Uh, Michael is asking, given very long back test data, you can use simple rules to identify our performance, but these results in the future being like the past. Um, a great question. Um, in general, back testing is a problem. This is another uh, thing that uh, Zach and my dad and I have been working out. Uh, thank you, Gaurav. Um, back testing per se, there's a trade off between uh, simplicity. You can make a more complicated back tested model, obviously not just overfitting, but in general, you're searching a broader space, right? And that needs to be penalized somehow. There's been some research on this, but we're, we're looking into do some other stuff. Um, there's, uh, is there any provable benefit to backtesting? The only, it's fine, it's circular. The only possible proof to backtesting would come from backtesting. How else can you prove it? Even if you go forward, you're still in a sense backtesting because suppose you go forward and it didn't work. We'll never hear about you. But if you went forward and it worked, we'll hear about you and we'll think, oh my God, the guy's a genius. He really found something. But really it's still ultimately just backtested, just kind of conditional. Craig, I wonder if it's maybe just my eyeballs. Maybe this is good, these green and blue. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think so. I just tried that again with, um, there is a measure for human vision of distance between colors. And I tried it and it worked out really well, except I did it on a man page and so I lost it. So there's a, there's a distance function for color distance. Uh, in Wolfram? Yeah. So if you look at color distance. Colors near? Uh, no, just colored. Look at the um, the function itself. Oh, it has a method. Uh, yeah, it has a distance function. Okay. And um, if you open details and option, if you use that, what the one of those distance functions, LCH color is kind of how humans perceive color. C, uh, not the CMC, the color difference defined in LCH color. Yeah, or, I'll I'll type in what I what I mean. So, CIE two thousand. Yeah. Something like that. Nice. This one? Yep. Oh, nice. Is that just black and yellow? Looks like it. Yeah. I'll copy it just to be correct. Oops. Uh, Michael's asking, can you, oh, that does look better. Maybe I just need more neighbors. I could try swapping them too. Uh, you can hold back data. Michael, um, that may, that's kind of pretty. Uh, you can hold back data. Uh, even if you hold back data and you have a, out, out, a, an out of sample validation or even an out of sample test data, um, and yes, that's the standard approach in machine learning. There's no guarantee that, here, I'll give you an example. Suppose um, somebody comes to you uh, and uh, they said they spent the last 30 years locked alone, alone, alone in a room eating crackers and drinking water and doing nothing. They've done nothing, they've just been in stasis. Now they walk out, the first thing that comes to mind is, man, I, I wonder if a stock named Apple would have performed well historically. That's the only hypothesis they've ever tested. Uh, they have nothing else, right? There's no even training. They look at it, wow, it worked great. Now they're knocking on your door and you have, you're running a, a fund of funds or whatever, you're an investor. And like, look, I've honestly, you can scan my brain. I've never tried any other hypothesis. The only one I tried, would you invest in them to buy Apple going forward? Historically, it's the greatest bet ever, right? Would you, would you buy them? Would you agree with them now? No, because there were probably millions of other people like this person locked in a room you know, exaggerating who walked out and said, man, I think Enron is the greatest stock to ever invest in ever. Turned out not to work, not to work, not to work. There's a selection bias that happens with the results. Uh, you could, that having a validation test and a, and a, and a test cases is, is helpful, but it's certainly not a guarantee because you don't know how many other people are doing what you're doing. Crowd of ninjas wearing COVID masks. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, how do I read that? Uh, Elad, is that Elad? That's Perfect. awesome. Um, so if there's 
I don't know if there's any other questions that people want to ask. If not, uh, we'll record this. We'll send it along. Uh, hope, Philip, if you can send me your presentation, I can also forward it to the group because we have this big mailing list. And I, I thank you so much for your time coming to, to share with us all your knowledge today. Uh, it was really great. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Really fun. I'll see everybody Monday.